Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Tonight, the message that God has given me to speak to you, I am living out right now. And tonight, the title of this message is called Stirredness. And it's taken out of the scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 13, or 13, 32. So if I could have it up on the overhead, if you could put Deuteronomy 32. I want to read it to you, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into what God has. Is that all right? So it says, he found him in a desert land, speaking of Israel, speaking of God in Israel in Deuteronomy. This is a song of Moses. So Moses is now speaking to the children of Israel, and he's singing this amazing song in the 32nd chapter, and he's describing what God is doing to Israel. And he says, he found him in a desert land, and, he, and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Next verse, please. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So here Moses is relating Israel and the wilderness experience coming out of Egypt to God, finding them in this howling, hard, desert place that they are the apple or the pupil or that soft part, that very delicate part of God's eye. That they are always before him. And then he begins to speak and he begins to sing this song that God is as a mother eagle who stirs up her nest. And tonight I want to speak about a wilderness experience. And I want to talk about when the nest is stirred up by the mother eagle. How do we get through it? What is God doing? And where do we go from here? So, Father, I thank you tonight for the Holy Spirit, who is our mother, our father, our helper, our comforter, our teacher, our instructor, miracle worker, precious and wondrous spirit of the living God. We invite you to come and to speak to our hearts tonight. Where I am inept and unable, I thank you for your grace tonight to speak a word into this church's heart. Lord, where I may not make sense, I thank you that you take my thoughts and you take that which I'm living in right now. And Father, you would cause it to make sense to my family. And I thank you, Father, that you want to talk to us. You want to give us insight. You want us to soar with you. You've created us for special and magnificent things to walk in. And I thank you tonight that the destiny of the people of this house and my family will fulfill their purpose and their destiny in their generation. And I thank you, Father, now in Jesus' name for this wondrous and amazing privilege of opening the word and looking in to what you would have for us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll give somebody a high five. My glasses. Okay, I am now wearing two and a half reading glasses. Are you, at first it started with 1.1, 1. 1, then it went to 1.5, then it went to 2. Now I've got these big thick things that are 2.5 for all of our boomers that are finding that they need reading glasses. You know what I'm talking about. But I wanted to start out tonight. I started out a little serious, but can I just tell you a, a funny? Can I give you a funny? Okay, I'm the worst joke teller in the world, but I'm gonna, I rehearse this, so I hope it's better. Because I laugh at my own jokes because I think they're hysterical. So there was a boomer, and he was retired, and he went into Milwaukee, into the, into the Corvette dealership, and he bought a Corvette, his dream car. So he pulls out of the dealership, and he gets onto the I-94, and the wind is blowing through whatever hair he has left. And he starts to, to just put the pedal to the metal, and he starts going 80 miles an hour. Now he's on the I-94 headed towards Madison, Wisconsin, and he is opening this car up. So before you know it, he's at 90, and then he's at 100, and he looks back in the rearview mirror, and there are flashing lights following him. Well, something overcomes him, and he doesn't understand it, but he hits the car. He hits the, the gas pedal, and he, he goes to 110. 
Now they're really coming after him. One car really coming after him. Then he goes to 120. Then he gets a hold of himself. He says, what am I doing? And he pulls over. He says, I'm too old for this. He says, I'm, I, I can't be doing this. And he pulls over and he waits for the state trooper to come. So the state trooper comes over to the car and he gets out his ticket and he gets out all his paraphernalia and he says to him, do you know you were going 120 miles an hour? The boomer says, you know what, I don't know what overcame me. I don't know what happened to me. This is a brand new car, and I just lost my mind. He said, I am so sorry. And the state trooper said, well, you know what, this is Friday. This is my last shift. I'm, my shift is over in 30 minutes, and if you can give me a really good excuse that I have never heard before, I will not give you a ticket, and I'll let you off the hook. Without skipping a beat, the boomer thought and paused, and he looked at him, and he said, well, he said, 20 years ago, my ex-wife ran off with a state trooper, and I thought it was you when you were trying to bring her back. <laughs> the state trooper looked at him and said, have a nice weekend. <laughs> so how'd I do? <laughs> Stirred nest. So here we see God likening himself and his, his happenings with Israel as a mother eagle. And I, I don't know if you know this about eagles or not. Most of you probably do. But eagles are an amazing bird. They're, obviously, they're the, the symbol of the American bird. I mean, I'm glad Benjamin Franklin didn't get his way when he wanted us to have a turkey. But eagles are magnificent birds. They are at the top of their food chain. They're in the vulture family, and they are majestic, and they've been made to soar upon the high winds of the earth. They have no predators against them. They are at the top of the bird food chain. And so if you are born an eagle, you are born privileged. But a mother eagle has a very interesting job. When she builds her nest, and it's a nest that she builds on the highest crags and the highest cliffs that they can find, the mother and the father. But the mother eagle, when she builds this nest, she lines it with down from her chest. She fills it full of sticks, and it's a strong nest, and it's perched where there's no predators that can come and destroy these eaglets or these eggs. So the eagles, when they begin to hatch, they're called hatchlings, and for three months, they go from a hatchling to a fledgling, and they are ready to fly. They grow quickly, and they are covered in brown feathers, and they're actually bigger than they will be when they're bald. Their white feathers come in because the brown feathers of the fledglings are actually thicker, and they're a little clumsy. But they're beginning to flap their wings, and they're ready now to begin to take their place in the creation role that God has made for them. They're ready to fly, but they're afraid. For some reason... Why is it that when you're made to soar on the heights of the winds, there's an accompanying fear that you can be dashed to pieces and fall? Just seems that's how life is, isn't it? So that mother eagle, she knows that she has one last job, and that is to stir the nest and to give them a push and to get these eaglets and these fledglings out of a safe and a comfortable place where they have grown and where they have been comforted. They have been fed by the mother eagle. They have cried out, feed me, feed me, feed me, and she brings the food. But now they've outgrown this comfortable place, but they're afraid to fly. And so she has to do something. She has to begin to push them and to give them that push and the confidence that they don't have because they don't know yet that they can fly. It's instinct. They have wings and they have feathers, but they don't know what they're made for. And so with one last effort, when they finally won't get out of the nest, she begins to stir the nest. She begins to break that nest up. She begins to tear it apart so they can no longer stay in that nest and rest and reside there. That comfortable place where they grew and where they were comfortable and where they had their mother and where everything was wonderful, where they hatched from those eggs and where they didn't have to do anything but just grow and be. Now suddenly that nest is starting to be destroyed by the very one that they trusted. And not only does she begin to destroy the nest, but now she begins to give them a shove and a push because they're still clinging on. 
And as she begins to push them out of that nest and destroy that nest, they begin to flap wings and they begin to learn to fly. And as they begin to fly, if they begin to flounder, she will come and she will come underneath them with her great and her mighty wings and she will carry them on her wings to a safe place and teach them how to soar in the currents of the wind because they are bald eagles and they are created not to stay in a nest but they are created to soar and to be what God's made them to be. Majestic, beautiful, incredible beings, creatures made by God. And so God talks about stirring the nest. He talks about pushing us out. And I want to talk tonight about stirred nests. And what I mean by that is when you have been in a place that's comfortable, when you have been in a place where you have grown and, and you've fought your battles and, and God has been good, and you don't have any desire to go fight new battles or to go to new places. You're very comfortable. You know how to be in that nest. You know how to operate in that nest. You know how to live in that nest. You know how to have faith for that nest. And you know how to survive in that wonderful nest. And all of a sudden, here comes the Father. Here comes God. And without any Without asking you if you're ready or not, all of a sudden he starts attacking the nest and he starts pushing you out. And before you know it, you feel like you're falling and you're in a place you've never been and you come to a wilderness place. I want to talk to you tonight about that place. And I want to talk to you tonight about new places in God. What is God doing? And how do we survive a stirred nest. And so I want to go to Exodus chapter 3 because I want to look at a man who I think is a phenomenal example of this. His name is Moses. So if you go with me to Exodus chapter 3, let me begin reading. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Harib, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I want to look at a stirred nest, and I want to look at what Moses did and what God required of him and what was happening in his life and equate it to what I'm going through. Not that I'm Moses or God has called me to such a magnificent place as that, but actually he has. Because Jesus said, of those born of woman, talking about John the Baptist, there's none greater than John the Baptist. That means greater than Moses. But then Jesus said, but yet he who is born of the Spirit, is born of the kingdom, is greater even than John the Baptist. And that is you and that is me. Because God has a plan that is bigger than we know. He has seasons and reasons and times and places and circumstances. And it may be like I am going through right now. You might be in a stirred nest situation right now. Maybe you don't know what's going on. Maybe you don't know why your prayers aren't being answered. Maybe you don't know where God is. Maybe you're wondering, what the world, God, what's going on here? Everything was fine, and now then all of a sudden everything's just turning on me, and I don't get it. Maybe that's not where you're at, but maybe you know somebody who is, so I pray this message will be a blessing to them through your lips. But Moses, it says in chapter 3 of Exodus, was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Wait a minute. Moses was a prince of Egypt. Forty years that man was raised in the palace. Forty years God, from the time he was an infant, had caused him to be loved and favored by Pharaoh's daughter. She scooped him up out of the Nile. She brought him into the palace of her father. He was raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was taught the language, and he was taught the history, and he was taught the science, and he was taught the education of the greatest civilization on the earth at that time. He was a prince of Egypt. 
he was favored and he was used to having his way. He knew how to operate in Pharaoh's palace. He knew the secret places. He knew the guards. He understood what was protocol. He understood and grew very used to being the pampered prince of Pharaoh's daughter. And that is where God had him in a beautiful nest for 40 years. Then all of a sudden, it comes into Moses' heart because he's a misfit and he, he's with the Egyptians, but he doesn't fit with the Egyptians. He's in the world, but he's not of the world. Something's not quite right. So he comes into his heart to visit his Hebrew brothers. And he sees an Egyptian slave. He sees an Egyptian guard harassing a Hebrew slave. And he gets in between them, and he kills this Egyptian. Now, Stephen tells us in Acts, the seventh chapter, that Moses knew he was the deliverer. Stephen tells us in Acts, the seventh chapter, if you'll look at verses 23 to 29, you can read this on your own, that Moses was mighty in word and deed as a prince of Egypt. So I want you to know and to understand that Moses, at this nest that he was in, had grown to be a strong and a confident Man that was in Pharaoh's palace, mighty in word and deed. And all of a sudden, he steps into this place of being the deliverer because he knew he was Israel's deliverer. He kills an Egyptian, and the next day he comes back, and the man that had caused the trouble said to Moses, are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? And Stephen recites in Acts chapter 7 that Moses then grows fearful and he runs from Pharaoh's retribution and the treason, the betrayal that he has now lived. And he runs into the desert place and into the wilderness. And there he lives for 40 years. A stirred nest. But God, I'm the deliverer. But God, I can do this. But God, just let me at it. I know what to do. He does it in his own strength. He does it the wrong way, and before you know it, God has stirred his nest and taken him into a wilderness place. Now, it's interesting here that he is tending the sheep of someone else, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. It's not even his flock. All of a sudden, we see what his life has turned into. From the prince and the palace now to a wilderness place, and he doesn't even have his own flock of sheep. He's now tending Jethro's flock. He's been reduced to nothing. Where he was somebody, now he's a nobody. Where he could live and function in that world of the palace, now he has to learn in a place that he's never been in, in a howling and a difficult and a hard place. He has to learn how to survive and how to function because God's got him in a brand new training ground. And even though he may be rebuking the devil and telling the devil, no, you're not going to do this to me, his prayers are not being answered and he has to live there for 40 years. Have you ever had prayers that aren't answered? And you're thinking, oh, the devil, I'm in a spiritual battle. What if you're not in a spiritual battle? What if you're in a new training ground? What if you're in a new school? What if the nest is being stirred? What if God has a bigger plan than you know? But you've got to go back to square one. What you once knew, now you've got to learn something brand new in your life. Where you were comfortable in this position, now all of a sudden you're a nobody and you have no position and you're like a fish out of water and you don't know how to survive in the desert. You've never been in the desert. You've been in the palace. But now you got to know where the water is. you got to know how you can walk. you got to know how you can survive. you got to know. You know why? Because someday you're going to be leading Israel back into that wilderness and you cannot lead where you have never been. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God stirs the nest. God shakes us up. God says, you think you're at the end. You think you've reached your edifice. You think this is where I want you. But oh, no, when everything else starts to change in your life, when you've done all you know to do, you've prayed the prayer of faith, you've believed God, and now your world is inside out. When Jim and I went on sabbatical, we thought we were going to be on this long leave and have some fun. We didn't know how serious his back was and the illness that was going to try to attack him and take him out and put him in a wheelchair. 
We didn't know that. We thought we were just going to step away into this wonderful place. Well, we've earned this. We've worked all these years. We've worked so hard. Why, it's our time. But you see, it isn't our time. It's God's time. And God has a plan, and God has a purpose, and God has a place. And it may seem like every dream has died. It may seem like every plan has been skewed. It may seem like not one prayer has been answered. But you see, what if I'm in a spiritual training ground for a new plan that God has for our lives? And God's stirring the nest. See, I don't know what you're going through tonight. I don't know where your lives are. But if your prayers aren't being answered, if things aren't happening, maybe, just maybe, like me, God's got you in a new training area. And you're in a new boot camp. And what you think you knew, that's going to be useful, but you've got a whole new set of skills necessary to learn so that you can be useful to the king and the purpose that he has for your life. So, in this wilderness place, Moses is tending Jethro's flock, not even his own. So, if I was going to tell you some things that God is speaking to me in this wilderness place when I am doing what I really wasn't expecting to do. God is speaking to me, and he spoke this word to me last week very succinctly with a dear friend of mine who's a doctor, and he was speaking about his own experience, he and his wife. And he used a word, and it just went into my spirit. It went into my spirit like an arrow, like a rhema, like light just going into my spirit. He used one word, and he said, surrender. When he was in a wilderness, he said, God taught him how to surrender. So if you are in a place that you've never been before, if you're in a hard place, a difficult place, like Moses, and like I'm learning how to do, learning, I would say, number one, the first thing that I'm learning that God's showing me is I've got to quiet down and surrender. Now, what does that mean, surrender? So I thought I'd do some word searches. Is that all right? What does the word surrender mean? Well, it means to relinquish possession of or control of something to another because of demand or compulsion. To relinquish possession or control of. When you and I surrender something, or when a nation surrenders under war to another nation, when I surrender to a feeling or an emotion, I am relinquishing possession of and control, and I'm giving that to another. So when Moses surrendered his life, he had to get the palace and Egypt and his dreams of being the deliverer out of him, because now the word says in Exodus chapter 3, that he's tending the flock of Jethro, not even his own sheep. He has no possessions. He has nothing. He is now a shepherd with a bunch of stinky, smelly sheep for 40 years, but he's been in that wilderness and that desert, and he knows every inch of it, and he knows how to survive in it. He has surrendered his dreams. He has surrendered his goals. He surrendered his passions, and he is content to be a simple shepherd watching someone else's flock. Now he's in a position for God to begin to speak. See, it may not take us 40 years. I hope not. And I want to be savvy with God. And I said to God, when he began to speak to me about this, Lord, I want to surrender quickly. I don't want to be a difficult child for you where I am complaining and where I am frustrated and where I am absolutely going inside out, trying to figure out and going here and going there and knocking on this door and knocking on that door. God, I want to quiet my soul in the place that you've put me now, at home, taking care of a sick husband, not able to go to church, not doing anything. My houses aren't selling. My design business isn't working. Nothing that I've planned, nothing that I thought I would be doing. No trips anywhere. We are just here, period. And God says, surrender and learn to be content and quiet in this place. It's the hardest thing for somebody like me to do because I'm noisy and I'm hyper and I have a plan a minute. But God says, learn to be content in whatever situation you're in. 
learn to relinquish control of your life. So I, I wrote down some thoughts about this. What do I have to do then to learn how to surrender? Surrender is a choice. To relinquish control of my plans, my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, my desires. You see, when I surrender that, I'm relinquishing the control of my thoughts. I am giving Jesus the control of my plans. I am giving the Holy Spirit control of my emotions. I am learning to let go and give it to God every moment of every day. And here's the thing about surrendering this kind of a surrender to the Lord. It's a choice, and it is moment by moment because it's death. I'm dying to myself, and I'm learning to live to Jesus Christ. Now, I have surrendered my life. I thought I was surrendered to the plan of God. But this is a whole new place and a whole new wilderness experience for me. Is that all right if I'm just honest with you? And here I am, going to be 65 years old this year. I am obviously no spring chicken. I am an old woman now, by anyone's standards, older. You would think at 65, you wouldn't have to start all over, wouldn't you? But you see, in the kingdom of God, age has not one thing to do with this. What has everything to do with this is the plan of God and what he has for us in the future. So God says, Debbie, you're going to have to learn how to moment by moment surrender your frustration. Surrender when things aren't going your way. Surrender when you get a bad report. We, we have this house for sale, and we built it to sell so that we could start another construction project. Well, that's all gone to seed in the natural. And last week, I am moving my mother-in-law's furniture into that empty garage because it's been sitting there empty and for sale for, since last June. Huge garage, empty. And I've got all this furniture I don't know what to do, so I was just going to move it into that house. Are you with me? I am with the movers in the moving van. They are picking the furniture up now. They're in that driveway. We've opened up the four-car garage. They are moving the furniture into the four-car garage. I run to the house because we live right next door to check on my husband because I haven't seen him and I want to make sure he's all right. He is on the phone with our realtor and the realtor is saying we've got this most amazing amazing offer. It's all cash closed in 10 days. And Jim says, stop everything. We got to get the furniture out of there. We got to put it in to Hollyhock. So I run back down to that garage and I say, stop, stop, stop. You're not going to believe this. We got to put it all back because they were just finished. Then I have to move the cars out of the garage because Jim can't pick up a thing right now. And I move all this furniture into Hollyhock's garage, the place where we're living, the house that we gave the church. We're living there. And then, three days later, the deal falls through. See, that's the kind of frustration I'm talking about. I'm talking about nothing going right. I'm talking about people looking at you like, what's wrong with you? You see, Moses was a prince of Egypt. Now he's in the wilderness. Now he's watching somebody else's sheep. Now it doesn't look like he's successful. It looks like he's a number one failure. It looks like he's done it all wrong. It looks like the favor of God is not on him. It looks like everything's going the opposite direction, and it's too late for him. But God says, when you surrender moment by moment, day by day, your frustration, your discouragement, your fear, everything that people are saying about you, you got to take it and you got to surrender it and give it to me because I am your God. I have a plan and I have a purpose. I need you to walk in faith. I need you to be at peace. I need you to understand that it's not over till I say it's over, but you've got to surrender moment by moment, day by day, thoughts, words, actions. When the nest is stirred, it's time to surrender to God in new ways because he's taking you to new positions in a new time and a new season. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good 
who are accustomed to doing evil. In other words, you can't change yourself. I can't change me. I am finding I cannot change one single thing. I can only surrender my life and my time on this planet to the king who has made me and created me. And if he chooses to stir the nest, then my job is to follow and to serve and to surrender my time, my life, and my thoughts and my behavior to him moment by moment. All right, Moses turned to look at this bush. It's an amazing thing because he knows the desert now. He turns to look at this bush, and he sees the bush is burning, but he's not, it's not being consumed. So when the Lord saw, verse 4, so when the Lord saw that Moses turned to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Now, God did not speak to Moses until Moses passed by that bush and gave it his attention. And when Moses turned to look at that bush, then God began to speak. You see, in a wilderness time, it may seem like you're not hearing from God. And you'll be tested, and you'll be tempted, and you'll be tried. But will you be faithful? Will you be faithful to the things of God? Will you be faithful to do and to follow and to do what you know to do when nothing seems right? Because Moses walks by that bush as if he can pass by. Let me tell you something about the things of God. If you can pass by the things of God, you're not called. You're either called or you're not. You see, you can live saved and you can live called. When the church lives saved, they fit God into their plans. When the church lives called, they fit their plans and their life into God's purposes. It's a whole different thing. A whole different thing. When you live saved, God fits into your life. When you live called, you fit into God's plans and purposes, and you surrender. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, if I can have that up on the board, Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Listen, Christianity, this walk with God, is not a walk in the park. It is a walk with a cross on our back. It is a walk one foot in front of another, following after the master and surrendering every thought and every deed and every word and every action, every emotion to him. John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln. It's the wrong Booth. General William Booth, sorry was asked to reveal the secret of his success. Now, General William Booth is the founder of the Salvation Army back in London in the 1800s. How many of you have heard of the Salvation Army? He, he founded it with his wife, Catherine, and it's still going today. And it says here that when he died, 150,000 people filed by his casket. 40,000, including Queen Mary, attended his funeral. It was a remarkable end for a man born into poverty and who worked in the midst of poverty his whole life. William Booth was a remarkable man who was given the title the prophet of the poor. He is best known today as the founder and the first general of the Salvation Army. So General William Booth was once asked to reveal the secret of his success. After some hesitation, tears came to his eyes and he said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been many men with greater brains than I have, men with greater opportunities, but from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus could do with them, on that day, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth that there ever was. It was, which, it was this statement that led Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman, the questioner and the interviewer, to remark, I learned from William Booth that the greatness of man's power is the measure of his surrender. The greatness of man's power is the measure of his surrender. Surrender. Every day, every moment. And when you mess up, just get back and just remember that you are not your own. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to Jesus. In this wilderness time of stirred nests, the next thing God's showing me is to focus on what's important. Because the enemy wants to get my focus on other things. Now, I heard this illustration, and it ministered to me. 
And there was a professor, and he was teaching his science students a lesson on time management. And he had a gallon glass jug with a small opening. And he was showing them on this large stage what he was trying to get across to them. He had large, chunky rocks. And he took these rocks, and he put these rocks into this glass gallon jar. He put as many as he could get in there. And then he took, and he showed it, and he held it up to his students, and he says, is this glass jug full? And the students say, yes, you can't get another big rock in there. That's it. Then he said, well, watch this. And he took a bag of gravel, small stones, and he began to pour the gravel into this large gallon jug. And the gravel began to fill it up, and he shook it, and he filled it up, and he shook it, and he filled it up. He held it up. He said, now is this glass jug truly full? His students said, yes, it is. He says, watch this. Then he took another bag of sand. And he tapped on that jar, and he shook it, and he began to pour sand into that glass gallon jar. And sand started to go in that jar until it came all the way to the top. And he held it up, and he said to his students, now is the jar full? And the students said, yes, you can't get any more sand in there. You can't get any more. That is it. That jar is full. He said, watch this. Then he took water, and he began to pour the water into the gas or the glass jar, which had the big stones, had the gravel, had the sand, and now here comes the water. And as he shakes it, and as he moves it, and he tamps it, it's amazing how much water he was able to put into that gallon glass jar. He then asked his students, what does this say? And a student jumped up and he said, I know, I know. It means that no matter how busy your day is, you can always get more things in it. And he said, wrong. That's not what it's saying. He then talked to his students. He said, look at this jar. If I had not put the big rocks in first, they would never have gotten in with the gravel, the sand, and the water. He said, what this is to show you is that in focus, in time management, do your big rocks first before anything else in your life. Because your life will be filled up with gravel and sand and water. Time will come and things will come and they'll steal away the time and they'll steal away your day and before you know it, you can't get the big rocks in there because the gravel, the sand, and the water is already in the jar. Then he asked his students, and I'm going to ask you this, what are the big rocks of your world? You see, the big rocks represent the most important things. The big rocks represent your vital assignments that no one else can do and that you alone are responsible for, and they are to get done before anything else. For instance, the big rock first that goes in the jar would be God first, time with God, faithfulness to God, loyalty to God. That would be a big rock in my day because I can't surrender if I'm not seeking him. The next rock would be my family, my husband. He is my husband. No one else on this planet can be his wife. I'm the one that God chose to be Jim's wife. That means I'm to care for him, love him, submit to him, do all that God's asked me to do because that's my creation role. Like that eagle was made to soar and to do. I was created for purposes of God, and my purpose, my rock, is to take care of this man. When I had children... That was my next purpose, is to be the mother to them, because no one else could be their mother. I'm the mother. It's my job to keep the home. You see, the big rocks, the, the work, the job, you can't feed the family if you're not going to work. That's a big rock in your life. The assignments, or if you're a student, school, so that you can make something of yourself. What are the big rocks of your life? Because if you don't put them in your day first, the sand, the gravel, and the water will steal away your time. Focus. Focus focus in a wilderness time because I'll tell you, everything's going to come to steal. I, I know the last thing I want to say tonight about being stirred and the nests that are being stirred and the wilderness time. Moses was 40 years a prince of Egypt. Then he was 40 years a shepherd. And then all of a sudden God comes to him and says, Moses, take off the shoes that you're wearing for the place where you are living, where you're standing is holy ground. Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. 
I have heard the cry. I have seen their affliction. I have seen what Egypt is doing to them. I am going to deliver my people. And Moses, I'm delivering them, and I'm sending you. You see, God delivers on this earth through his people. And when you think that you're in a place that nobody knows where you are, when you think that you have failed, when you think that everything's gone south, when you think that nothing's worked, when you think, what's going on in my life? If you will hold on and if you will surrender every moment of every day, if you have to do it consciously, surrender it to God. It's a daily choice. The person you desire to be tomorrow will depend on the choices that you and I make today. The person I desire to be tomorrow depends on the choices I am making today. Surrender. Focus the big rocks. What are the things that no one else can do? Those are the big things in your life. Get those done first. And this last thing, number three, is be grateful. Be grateful. Because the enemy will do everything he can to discourage your hearts. To tell you that you have failed, that God doesn't know where you are, that you, God is mad at you. He's not a good God. He is a good God. God is a faithful God. God is not a man that he should lie. If you feel like you're on a shelf right now, or if you feel things aren't working for you right now, get ready, get ready, get ready, because you are in a new training ground, and there are new things for you to learn and do, and God has not even begun to do what he's going to do with you yet. But you've got to stay put and be willing to let the process work itself out because God said to Moses, I am now sending you. But you've got to take off your shoes, Moses, because the place where I'm standing is holy ground. Moses, your shoes represent your life, where you've walked and what you've done. You tried, Moses. You tried to deliver Israel in your own power. But Moses, you can't access the supernatural kingdom of God with the arm of the flesh, with human talent, with human youth, with human beauty, with human ability. God doesn't use human ability. He uses people that believe him, that will surrender their lives, and that will be faithful to the call and stay put where God's put them and let God work the process out in their life. Take off your shoes, Moses, because where I'm sending you, your human ability is not going to be able to do it. But, oh, Moses, when you begin to step into my shoes, when I begin to put you on, Moses, when I begin to wear you and inhabit you in front of Pharaoh, Moses, there's not a devil in hell that will be able to stand before you as you deliver my people. <laughs> Surrender. Focus. And give thanks. Be grateful. Why? Because the enemy is going to want to tell you that it's too late and you're going to lose heart. And God says, don't lose your heart. It's in your heart, your soul, and your spirit. That eternal part of you, that's where the anointing is. That's where the spirit brings you revelation. Your heart. And God says, give thanks. In 1 Thessalonians, if I can have it up on the board, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 13, it says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Give thanks when things aren't working? Yes. Give thanks not for the situation, but give thanks in the situation. Oh, Father, I'm grateful today that I have eyes to see and ears to hear, legs to walk, and I can breathe the breath of life on this planet. You're not done with me yet. Oh, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for healing my husband. Thank you for ministering to my church. Thank you for the anointing that breaks yokes and lifts burdens. Thank you that my people are being birthed into a new realm of faith with this new team that's coming up. God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you begin to be grateful because a grateful heart will endow and establish a joyful soul. If you want to live in joy, what fuels joy is thanksgiving. When you stop complaining and you start thanking. When we all went on that fast in January, God told me, I don't want you to go on a food fast. I want you to fast contention, a critical spirit, and complaining. I want you to fast contention, being argumentative, being contrary, always looking at the whys. How comes? I don't agree. Contention. Says a contentious woman, it's easier to live on the rooftop of a house than with a contentious woman. She's like a dripping faucet. Contentious. Are you angry? Are you always refuting and rebutting? 
Are you always upset about something? Are you frustrated? Contentious. God says you're going to have to fast that and surrender that urge and that need to me every day. Then he said, oh, how about the complaining voice, child? See, when you complain, you're speaking death out of your mouth and not life. Now, I teach this. Just because I teach it doesn't mean I live it. Listen, that's why new places are so good for us. Hard places are God's training field, God's advancement to teach us to fly in new places. Complaining. How come this and well that? Complaining. And God says, I don't want to hear your complaining. I want your voice to speak thanksgiving. Look for what's good. Whatever things are good, whatever things are noble, whatever things are honest and worthy of praise, those things you're to think on and those things you're to speak because when you speak out of your mouth, you're made in the image of Almighty God. You're not a dog. You're not an eagle. You're not a cow. You're not a horse. You are not a creation on this earth. You were born human beings made in the image of God and God has far more for you and has more for you to do and more for you to go and more for you to learn than you can imagine possible. But you got to change your thinking and it's got to come out of your mouth, not complaining, but thanksgiving. People haven't recognized how talented you are then just thank God for your boss. Thank God for your work. You know, when we complain about the things that God's given us, we start to dishonor those things. Well, my husband was so sick. And he went into surgery. It was a five-hour surgery. I realized, God, you hold his breath in your hand. It would be so easy for him just to be snuffed out. What would it be like without Jim on the earth? My heart broke, and I, I just thank God for this incredible man that he allowed me to live with all these years and to birth a family with. I begin to appreciate Jim and to thank God for him and his amazing skills. Are we perfect? Do we fight? Yes. Listen, anybody that tells you their marriages are perfect, it's a lie. There are times and seasons. It's not how great you get along all the time. It's how you work through the difficulties and love each other and stay together and work it out and raise a family and stay faithful and one foot in front of another and you become one. It's a time and a season and a lifetime of love that you learn how to love. Marriage is tough. Take two separate people, two opposite ends. It's not easy, but it's God and it's good. And God never said it would be easy, but he said it would be worth it. And I can tell you it is. Fast. I had to fast contention. One month I fasted it. Then I said, God, I want to fast it all year because I think it's making a happier man. It's making a better me. I want to fast a critical spirit. I don't want to see what's wrong. I want to see what's right. I don't want to complain. I want to give thanks. So if your nest is being stirred, if you're in a hard place, if you're in a new place, and you feel like a fish out of water. You ever seen a fish out of water? My, my son's a fisherman, and when he flips those fish up on the shore, and the gills start going like this, and they're gasping for the atmosphere that they've been birthed into, the water where the oxygen, their gills are made to extract, and they can't breathe, and they're gasping, and their mouths are going like this, and their gills are going like that. Do you know, have you ever seen that, that image? You see, sometimes you feel like a fish out of water. You feel like you're gasping for an atmosphere, for air, for something. Where is my atmosphere? Where is my comfort zone? Where can I breathe? And God says, calm down. I'm bringing you to a new place. I'm going to teach you to breathe in a new atmosphere. I'm going to show you how to soar where you've never soared. I am going to show you how and what I've made you to be. And you're going to do more and be more than you could ever dream possible. But I need you to surrender. I need you to focus, and I need you to give thanks. God is faithful. He will perform and perfect that which concerns you and me. Well, tonight, I have one more thing I want to say, and that is about surrender. And if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, that's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. And the word is so important because... A lot of people in America think that they're following God and they're following Jesus, but they've not surrendered. They've not given him all of their life, all of their heart, all of their soul, their personality. 
Maybe you've been in and out, up and down, back and forth, and you're here tonight, you're thinking, I need to do that. I know God's speaking to me. I remember when I was young, back in the Jesus movement, and I was in Santa Barbara, and I was just a kid. Well, I wasn't a kid. I was 28 years old, 27 years old. But I knew that I hadn't, I knew who Jesus was, but I knew I hadn't surrendered my life to him. I'd been living a life outside of him. There was a moment in time when God called me and spoke to me, and I came to a church and I changed my heart and I asked Jesus into my life to be Lord and Savior. Lord means boss. Savior means I need a Savior. I can't save myself and neither can you. So if you've never done that or you have backslidden or you know tonight God's speaking to you, I just want you to lift your hand right now because we're going to do this together. I'm just going to ask if there's anybody in this audience that needs to get right with God, lift your hand right now, right now. Well, I'm asking you, I'm not going to count to three. I'm not going to do that. Oh, there's a hand. I see it. I see that hand. Lift them high. Let me see you right now. You're here tonight on a rainy night. God brought you here for such a time as this. You know, God's speaking to you. I see that hand. Anybody else need to get right with God tonight? Let's do it now. Let's just do it now. Let's just cut the, the you know what, and let's just get it done. Let's get it right. Let's get it right with God. You can't change you, but he can. He's not in shock over your sin. He's not in shock over how you're living. He's not in shock about anything. He loves you. He's a good God. He has a good plan for your life. But you have to do it his way, not your way. Anybody else need to get right with God tonight? I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm not selling knives at a county fair. I'm inviting you. I am a messenger inviting you to come and meet the one that made you and created you. I can change you. You have to come. He's already done everything he's going to do. Now you have to receive it. I see that hand. Anybody else? I've seen about five or six hands. This is what we're going to do because of the time. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If you raise your hand to get right with God, to surrender all of your heart and all of your life tonight, I just want you to come quickly. Meet me at this altar. Let's get right with God. If you didn't raise your hand and you should have, then just come. It's not too late. Just come. Bring your purse. Bring your Bible. Bring a friend. Bring whoever you came to church with. Just come and let's just get right. Let's just get right now. God is speaking to you now. 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 Now, not tomorrow, tonight. Now is your time. Quickly come, quickly come, quickly come. Just as quickly you come. Are, don't you hear? Quickly come. The we'll give time to you. We'll wait for you. It's the most important thing you'll ever do with your life. Just as Nothing starts until you surrender your life to him and let him be Savior and let him be Lord. If he's not been boss of your life, it's time to make him boss and Lord. Well, smile, because you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party. That's yours, and he loves you. He's got great things ahead for you. This is Pastor Joel. If you'll just make a turn this way. Left turn. Follow him, and we're going to pray with you privately, talk to you about some things. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. 
You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.